Well, hello again, friends. Last week uh, in our sermon, we asked the question, how are we supposed to read the Psalms? We had to think about how ancient Israel uh, would read them and sing them, didn't we? And, uh, and how they might point to God's promised king. And then we read them as ourselves, as people joined to God's promised king, Jesus. Well, we're going to do that again today in Psalm 127. Again, a song of ascents. I'm going to pray and then we'll read the psalm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We hang off your every word because they are your words. Would you apply them to our heart by your Holy Spirit? Would you take these words of mine and uh, make them yours? Uh, would you do your work uh, as you build the kingdom of your Son, Jesus? We pray in his name. Amen. Well, Psalm 127, I'm reading from the uh, Christian Standard Bible. Uh, you'll have a copy there on the screen. You can read along in your own Bible. Psalm 127, a song of ascents of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labour over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays alert in vain. In vain you get up early and stay up late, working hard to have enough food. Yes, he gives sleep to the one he loves. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons born in one's youth. Happy is the man who has filled his quiver with them. They will never be put to shame when they speak with their enemies at the city gate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Well, here's where we're going today. We'll be looking at this psalm from a few different angles. Unless the Lord builds a house for Israel, unless the Lord builds a house for David, unless the Lord builds a house for Jesus, for us. Firstly, Israel, David, Jesus, us. So we begin with Israel. Unless the Lord builds a house for Israel. Now let's imagine a farmer uh, in ancient Israel and he's singing this psalm. It's a song of ascents of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds a house, he sings, its builder labours over it in vain. Well, this might be the most basic lesson he needs to learn. Mate, you are totally dependent on your creator. You see, there's an attitude to work that rejects dependence on God, isn't there? I work hard to provide for my family. No one else can do it and no one else will do it. But work, the work of this farmer, can be an expression of dependence on God. Our farmer might say, well, the way you provide for me, Lord, is to make me able to do stuff. Then you produce fruit from those efforts to provide for me and for my family. The fruit might be a crop or it might be a finished house. You don't need my efforts to provide for me, but that's how you choose to do it. Well, it's the same idea for the watchman, isn't it? Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays alert in vain. Well, the watchman could say, the safety of the city is in my hands. Or he could pray, Lord God, would you use my eyes and my ears to keep this city safe? As he watches over the city, he might remember the story of Gideon. The Lord told Gideon, your army is too big for me to give you victory over the Midianites. But when you win, you might say, my own hand has saved me. No, says the Lord, your army of 30,000 must become 300 and then you'll know it's me who saved you. Well, what about an Israelite widow? She doesn't have a husband to work alongside to 
alongside of to provide for her family. So she gets up early and she works hard all day. She prepares dinner for her children. She works late into the night, each hour of sleep that she steals for herself is one less loaf of bread for her children, she believes. She alone is responsible for them. She's extremely anxious. But what does her Lord say to her in verse 2? In vain you get up early and stay up late, working hard to have enough food. Yes, he gives sleep to the one he loves. Well, it's a, it's a rebuke to her at first, isn't it? Daughter. Do you think you need to drive yourself into the ground to have enough food? Do you think your Lord needs you to stay up all night working and worrying? He can provide for you even while you sleep. In fact, because he loves you, he gives you sleep. He gives you sleep for the rest that you need because you've worked hard. But he gives you sleep to remind you of something too. The world will continue to revolve Without you, I will continue to provide for you and your family even while you sleep. So she says, okay, Lord, I trust you. Because you love me, I'll go to bed. Well, speaking of going to bed, it was something I should have done last night instead of watching YouTube clips of pregnancy development. Nine months in four minutes Oh, that was a computer animation uh, of from inside the womb. And then there was nine months in two minutes. It was a cute time lapse uh, of a two and a half thousand photos from the outside. Uh, nine months in the womb. Uh, that was a stages of, from an ultrasound. You get the idea. See, the development of a baby is the most staggering thing. I kept watching clip after clip. The heartbeat, did you know, can be heard at six weeks. And six weeks later, the little baby has fingernails. Pregnancy is an astounding time. But it's a time in the life of a woman where her creator whispers to her, this is a gift. This is out of your control. It's out of your hands. And our psalmist agrees in verse 3. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward. You see, a baby is another provision from God, isn't it? Dad plays a part, of course, and mum's body spends nine months working hard. But it's God who knits that little baby together in the womb, isn't it? The baby is a gift. It's not something we've crafted or made, like a painting, and it's certainly not something we've earned but they're a gift that keep on giving. Through the child, God continues to provide for his people. Verse 4, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons born in one's youth. Happy is the man who has filled his quiver with them. They will never be put to shame when they speak with their enemies at the city gate. See, God gave families to each other in Israel as one of his means uh, to provide for them. Security in old age, there's no welfare. Uh, they're your backup at the city gate. That's where disputes are settled. There's no legal aid. See, children were indeed a blessing from the Lord. Of course, that's why there are so many laments in the Bible by those who remain childless. And of course, the pain of childlessness continues today. And we'll talk about that in a little while. So what can we take from our first reading of Psalm 127 as an Israelite? Well, God shows his people that whether they acknowledge him or even if they don't, they are de dependent on him to provide, and provide he will. Now, before we move on from Israel, we need to have a look at that, that superscript at the beginning of the psalm. I'm going to speed up a little bit now. We're at point three. Unless the Lord builds a house for David. See, our psalm begins a song of ascents of Solomon. Well, just quickly, I want, to, I want to ask, why is this psalm chosen as one of the songs of ascents? Remember, they're the songs that Israel sing as they make their way towards Jerusalem for their festivals. 
I wonder if the key is in the idea of the Lord building a house. I wonder why that's, if that's why it's been chosen. The Lord building a house. Now, do you remember when King David decided to build a house for God? Now, what did God answer? I don't need you to build me a house. Did I ever ask for a house? No, David, I, the Lord, will build you a house, not another palace, but a family line, a dynasty, the house of David. The Lord then promised that a descendant of David would remain on the throne over God's people forever. The Lord would build a house for David. So I think that the Israelite pilgrims are actually celebrating, as they sing this psalm, they're celebrating this house that that, that King David, uh, has. God is making for King David. They celebrate that house as they make their way to Jerusalem. So Psalm 127 reminds us, the Israelites, of two things. The Lord's provision in daily life and his provision for his people in the house he builds for King David. Well, that's good if you're an ancient Israelite, but how does it apply to us? Well, we're getting there. Stay with me. We need to look at how it might relate to Jesus first. Point four, unless the Lord builds a house for Jesus. Now, can you cast your mind back to last year when we were in the first part of Matthew? Now, Jesus has just gone public at his baptism where three people tell us that he's the promised one. John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. What does the Father say? This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. He calls Jesus his Son, the Son of God, the Son of God. Now, that's the title that God gives his chosen king back in Psalm 2. By calling Jesus his son, the father declares, Jesus is my chosen king. Jesus is the descendant of King David. He's the son of God, of the house of David. Now, immediately after his baptism, The devil tempts Jesus with an idea. Well, if you are this son of God, then you can pretty much do what you like. It's your kingdom. Have it your way. But Jesus is not taken in. His answers to the devil show a deep trust in his father. They say, my father is building this house, this kingdom, for me. I will do it his way. See, Jesus displays this trust time and time again. From Luke uh, chapter 5. But the news about Jesus spread over, spread even more, and large crowds would come together to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Well, God really seems to be growing the kingdom, building this house for Jesus, doesn't he? People are flocking to Jesus. But Luke continues. Yet Jesus often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. Jesus prays. And I suspect at those times, as the crowds grew, Jesus might pray something like this, Father, your kingdom needs to grow in the way that you would have it. Build this house for me, but in your way. Or on the night Jesus is betrayed, he prays, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you, since you gave him authority over all people. Jesus has authority over all people, but he remembers it's his father who builds the house for him. Jesus does the work of salvation, and yet he's fully dependent on the one who sent him. Sent him. An hour or so later in the story, in the in the garden. Father, not my will, but yours. Or the next day at his death, into your hands I commit my spirit. Or after his resurrection, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. 
as Jesus works, the Father builds the house. Well, I've just used the first part of our psalm as an example, but you can, can you see how rich the psalms are for us when we see Jesus in them, how he embodies them, how he lives them, how they point to him in some way? Well, this has been hard work, hasn't it? The psalm the psalms has shown us the Lord's daily provision for his people, his building of a house for King David, his building of a house for his son Jesus. So how now might we read it? Unless the Lord builds a house for us. Now remember how the psalm helped our Israelite friends? As people of the very same God, they can help us in, this, in the same way. God doesn't need your efforts to provide for you, but he'll use them. So work hard and rest in trust. Or the safety of whatever or whoever you watch over is in God's hands. So keep watch, but trust him as you do. Or like our widow, your God can probably manage a night's babysitting of your children. Go to bed. You're knackered. Well, that's enough about that. Now I want to devote the rest of our time to how we, as God's people, fit in with the house that the Father has built for and through Jesus. Well, only Jesus can do the work that establishes this kingdom, couldn't he? His life, his death, his resurrection, and that work is finished. But there is kingdom work that isn't finished. See, our work is to witness to our Lord Jesus and his work. And Jesus modelled what it looked like both to work for his Father and depend on his Father as the Father builds the house. And if we want our work on this house to be useful, to not be in vain, we need to be like Jesus. Well, how? Well, the most immediate question I could think of in this way for my own life was this. Am I like Jesus as I write my sermons? So often I go far into the work of writing and I've not prayed this. Lord, would you use these words to do your work in your people? See, I could write the best sermon you could hope for. But if the Lord doesn't apply it to your heart, it'll be labour in vain. A sermon that doesn't, hasn't been prayed about is labour in vain. Of course, God is still free to use that sermon if I haven't prayed about it. But any good that he works for it will be despite my labours and not through them. We want, to, we want God to be able to use our labours willingly. Friends, unless the Lord applies the sermon, this pastor writes it in vain. So what should the pastor do? Well, pray. He prays that the Father would use this feeble work to build the kingdom of his Son. And of course, it's the same for you. As you speak and affirm the gospel in your corner of the world, Friends, prayer is the most important labour that you can do for your brothers and your sisters and the lost because it is your Lord who builds the house. If you are labouring at prayer, he will give you the opportunities to witness. Don't stress about that. But do pray. If you believe, the Lord builds the house. Jesus did. And finally, a word about this quiver full of children. The psalm tells us children are a blessing from the Lord. But perhaps if you're without children, you know this better than anyone. As you look at those with children, you may have even asked yourself this question. Did God give them all those children because he's pleased with them? 
And do I not have children because he is not pleased with me? Friends, the short answer from the Bible is no, that's not how it is. In the Bible, over and over again, God expresses his care and concern for childless couples and single people. He does not treat them with disdain, unlike the culture at the time that often did. Alongside the pain and disappointment of childlessness, God offers comfort. Now, similar to other kinds of hardship, the comfort does not guarantee a change in circumstances. You see, childless comes from living in a broken world. But for those joined to Christ, God offers both the comfort of his immediate love and his concern and his approval, as well as the promise uh, of a new and restored world. But right now, how might we view this section of the psalm uh, on children in the light of our Lord Jesus? Well, Jesus is the ideal human, isn't he? The most complete human, the giver of all life. Well, he didn't have children. And remember what his father said of him. With him I am well pleased. But whether you're married or single, have a large number of children or not, Jesus does want you to have children, kingdom children, or what Paul calls children in the faith. See, Paul calls Timothy his true son in the faith. Why? Because Paul has poured out himself into Timothy as a father would his son. He's nurtured Timothy's young faith. He took him under his wing. He prayed constantly for him. He loved him. And you can do the same for another. You can begin by praying for them. You don't need to uh, be uh, have a biological or adopted kids to buy the book that we were recommending last year, Five Things to Pray for Your Kids. It's said as a boy becomes a man, it's a good idea for his parents to look for another adult male influence in his life. And it's the same for girls, someone to look up to apart from their parents. Well, the kids are going to look for that someone anyway, so parents find someone who will lead them towards Christ. But You may or may not have kids, but are you someone that a parent would look to as a godly influence for their kids. It has been such an encouragement over my life to see so many couples who have been un- who have been unable to have children raising children of the faith. One couple ran the uh, kids club at our previous church. In another church, they brought new families to church. Wouldn't it be wonderful at the resurrection? to have a quiver full of kids like that. Friends, why don't we pray that God will use our labours, our prayers, to build the kingdom of the son he loves. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, through the work of Jesus Christ, you have established his kingdom. Would you continue to build that kingdom as you draw your people to yourself, would you be even pleased to use our labours in that? Would we put them in your care? Would we trust you in them, that they may not be in vain? We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.